rec league basketball or terrible dancing or overly enthusiastic teachers, you've probably never heard of me. And you're probably wondering why some 26-year-old is up here talking to you. Still, though, hopefully you've all come to the conclusion that whatever I have to say is more interesting than sitting and watching the clock tick on until 2.28. So, <laughs> so if you could just all uh, listen for a few minutes and humor me a little, I'd appreciate it. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of something. So if everyone could stand up, we're going to play a little game. <laughs> We 
talked, and we said, no, we're not going to put Rick away. We're going to bring Rick home and bring him up like any other child. We knew Rick was smart. We could tell by looking in his eyes. And when we talked to him, we, you know, he was paying attention to what we were saying. So we wanted to get a computer built so Rick could communicate with us. Everybody came to our house that night for Rick to say his first words. And everybody was betting, you know, what is the first words Rick is ever going to say? His mom saying, it's going to be, hi, mom. And me, the dad, saying, oh, it's going to be, hi, dad. Well, the Boston Bruins were going for the Stanley Cup, and the very first words Rick ever said was, go Bruins. Dick is a military man, so he knows a thing or two about commitment. This time, he's just months removed from a heart attack. This gift that he gives to his son, or is it the other way around? Either way, it all started when Rick heard about a charity run for a paralyzed athlete. He asked Dad, and Dad said yes. The gun went off, and we went off with all the other runners, and everybody thought that Rick and I would just go to the corner and turn around and come back. Well, we didn't. We finished the whole five miles coming in next to last, but not last. And when we got home that night, Rick wrote on his computer, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. So that was a very powerful message to me that we finally found a sport that Rick could get involved in just like everybody else. Rick is my motivator. He inspires me. To me, he's the one out there competing, and I'm just throwing him my arms and my legs so that he can compete. There's just something that gets into me when I'm out there competing with Rick that I can't explain it, and we're able to go faster. And it's just an unbelievable feeling. Rick and I love the Ironman Triathlon, to be out there competing with the best triathletes in the world to be accepted to compete along with these triathletes. Just to be out there on that pier with all the other triathletes and then waiting in the water for that cannon to go off, it was just so exciting. The feeling coming down the finish line at Aliki Drive, it's just an awesome experience. With the crowd there, all the excitement, noise and the announcers announcing all that the adrenaline just gets flowing. I may be disabled but I live a very fulfilling life and if someone takes the time to get to know me they will realize that I am no different than here he is, he graduated from public high school, he's graduated from college, he's out there competing in road races and triathlons, he lives a happier life probably than 95% of the population. Rick would tell you that, uh, you know, if he, if he was physically able to do something, that he'd probably play basketball or football or hockey, but then he always says, no, the first thing he'd do is sit down and have me sit down in his wheelchair and he'd push me. You know, it really makes me feel good that, uh, that, you know, he appreciates, you know, what I'm trying to do to help him out, and he'd do the same thing for me. Our message is, yes, you can. You can do anything you want to do, as long as you make up your mind. You can do it. If you have ever searched for the meaning of life, stop answer lies right here. By the way, Ricky would want us to tell you the Bruins look pretty good this year. Don't let words limit your life. You can do anything.
others, and you believe in yourself. Third, in the end, it's not in meeting the end goal. It's in the journey. A few weeks ago, I was at a wedding for one of my closest friends. During the homily, the priest said, when we die, God is going to ask us one question. How did you love? That's it. How did you love? God doesn't care about our awards or our grades or our jobs or the amount of money we make. God cares about how much we love. And in the end, that's all the people who really matter will care about you. Dick and Ricky Hoyt have figured this out. Dick's father, Dick, Ricky's father, gets up every morning and swims, runs, or bites. I'm not talking about some little 5K jog that most of us probably go on to train for our sport or stay in shape. This man runs Iron Leagues. It's a marathon, over a 100-mile bike ride, and a 2.4-mile swim. And he does it while pushing, pulling, or dragging his son with him. The other thing is, he's been doing this for a really long time, and now he's doing it over the age of 70. Pretty impressive. He does all of this because it makes his son feel alive. It's incredible. It's absolutely real love. When Ricky was born, the doctors told his parents he'd never do anything. In fact, they suggested that Ricky be institutionalized. Ricky's father saw potential in his son. He believed his son could do anything. Neil Ivey, one of my basketball coaches at the University of Notre Dame, used to tell us, people play better when you believe in them. And the most important person you can have believe in you is yourself. As Lisa said, I walked onto the basketball team at Notre Dame my senior year. Now, this wasn't exactly a smooth journey onto the team. My effort to make the team basically went like this. I'd wake up, I'd go to class, and then about once a week, I'd walk over to the women's basketball office. I'd go in and I'd see the receptionist there named Tyna, and I'd say, hey Tyna, any news on whether they're taking any walk-ons on the basketball team this year? She'd look at me, smile sadly, and say, nope, see you next week. <laughs> then I'd leave. I'd go play basketball at the rec center then for three hours, just about every day, with a group of 30 guys. This continued on for three years. At the end of my third year there, my junior year, I decided I'd make one final push to get on the basketball team. The guys that I played basketball with every day were completely behind me, and they decided to even write emails to the coaches asking them if I could have a tryout. Their emails ranged from rants like, let Mary play, with all capital letters, tons of exclamation marks, to more professional and kind letters that in the end were probably sufficiently more helpful. One of the professors that used to play with us sometimes even told me that he was having his kids write in sidewalk charts outside one of the assistant coaches' house, asking if I could have a tryout. Not sure if he did or not, if he did that or not, uh, but the thought of it made me chuckle. Eventually, I got an email from one of the assistant coaches. The email said, Mary, we're having tryouts after class on such and such a date. We look forward to seeing you there. And please tell all your friends that yes, we have received their emails. They can stop sending them. <laughs> Those guys I played with every day believed in me, and I went into the tryout knowing that the people I worked out with every day thought I was going to succeed. Still, though, I was pretty nervous. So as I walked over to the Joy Center for the tryout, I called my older sister and best friend, Maria. She picked up the phone and sounded a tad annoyed. Apparently, I had interrupted something extremely important. I said, Marita, I'm really nervous. What if I don't make the team? Marita replied, Mary, I don't have time for this nonsense. You just have to trust God. You can do anything with him. Now I have to go. Goodbye. And she was out. I went to that practice feeling more confident than I ever had before. When someone believes in you and you believe in yourself, you can achieve great things. Last, Dick and Ricky Hoyt understood the idea that it's not in making it to the finish line that counts. It's in the journey. These two men decided they would finish a race together. Along the way, they found they had willpower. They found they could dig deep and compete with everybody else. They found they could do more than they ever thought they were capable of. 
Dick told Ricky, Ricky Boy told his dad exactly what he wanted. He wanted to race. And then they worked. You don't just wake up and run an iron man. Even Bishop Guilfoyle's son, Bishop Guilfoyle great son Jack Heinish, who just completed an Iron Man, had to train for months and countless hours to do it. I'm sure there were multiple times when both of the boys wanted to quit during their race. But they didn't. Instead, they persevered. And it was in their journey that they ultimately triumphed. I learned this lesson twice while playing basketball. Like just about every little Catholic girl who grows up in Altoona, PA, I idolized the Bishop Guilfoyle students when I was a child. After watching the Lady Marauders compete for the state championship, I knew that all I wanted to do was to be just like Kristen Tuey. Shockingly, my second grade coach wasn't looking for the tallest player on his team with perhaps the most questionable ball handling skills to bring the ball on the board. So I became a post player instead. My senior year, we were playing for the state championship. And I remember Coach Michelle telling us that at this point, it's not about what they do. It's about what we do. That's what will make us winners. At the time, I'm sure I thought, Sure, Coach, if we execute 45 to a T and run motion 30 perfectly, we'll win. But I don't think that's what Coach Michelle was talking about. He was saying that we were going to, he wasn't saying that we were going to win because we were running the right plays. He was talking about winning because we knew we did everything in our power to prepare. Because we knew that along the way we had overcome so many obstacles. And because we knew that even when everything was stacked against us, we worked our hardest. I'll never forget talking with my teammates the day of the game. I asked if they were nervous. One of them replied, nope, we made it. We're playing a game we love with a group of people that we love. It was about what we did, not about what they did. And we won, so that makes it a little, a little easier to see all of this journey stuff. <laughs> The second time I learned this lesson, though, we didn't win. In addition to dreaming about playing for the Lady Marauders, I dreamed that I would one day play for the Fighting Irish. In fact, every night after I said my prayers, I would quickly and silently add, and God, please let me grow be six for four and play basketball for Notre Dame. Full scholarship, please, God. You gotta tell God what you want. Well, very little in that dream came to True, just the play for Notre Dame. But that was still a pretty big part. Still, though, the dream was a rough one. I cried more over failing to make the team or the tryout of the team than anyone should ever cry over a sport. God bless my family for listening to all of my songs. The summer going into my senior year of college, I remember thinking, maybe this isn't worth it anymore. Maybe I should just not try out. I remember calling my brother one night as I was walking on the beach and asking, hey, if I never make the basketball team, will our family still love me? I had forgotten what one of my Bishop Guilfoyle tennis coaches had said to me a few years before. There's much more to marry for than basketball. Tommy, of course, replied that yes, my family would still love me. In fact, I'm pretty sure his exact words were, of course, Rolly, you know, the sort of pathetic puppy from 101 Dalmatians. That's what he calls me. He said, of course, really. We'll always love them. That summer, I worked at the Helen Diller Home for Blind Children in Avalon, New Jersey. One day, one of my campers, a little boy who was completely blind, said to me, man, Mary, you're really lucky that you can see and that because of that, you can play basketball. I grew up a little after that, and I decided to tough it out. The journey was long and full of tears and laughs, but we made it to the national championship. The day we were there, the day that the dream I'd been dreaming for so long was coming true, well, not exactly my dream. You see, in my dream, I was actually playing in the game, and in real life, I was sitting on the bench. <laughs> uh, but regardless, that day, I talked to a group of my best friends. They were together. They were going to watch the game. They were all hanging out. And they were having a blast. And in that moment, I remember thinking, gosh, I wish I could just be with them right now. It was the journey that was special, 
It was the people that helped me along the way and the obstacles, sometimes of my own manufacturing that were overcome, that were special, not the finish line. I guess the finish line was a little special too, but it wasn't the, the best part of it. Sometimes we forget about the journey. We focus so much on the end that we give up because we can't see our progress. If only we knew how important the journey was to the goal, we'd never give up. So we've got three main points from the voice. First, love is all that matters. Second, believe in yourself and believe in others. And third, it's about the journey, not about the finish line. All right. Into the 
stands. I even scored a couple of bucks. As I walked out of the locker room, there was this little girl standing there. She looked up at me and she said, can I have your autograph? Yes, I know. You beat New Hampshire State and you are suddenly a top-notch celebrity. I was pumped. Sure, absolutely, I said. And I took her marker and I signed her poster. Thanks, Brittany, she squealed as she gave me a big hug. Then she looked down at her paper and a look of sadness and confusion came over her face all at once. Mary Four, she said. Who's Mary Four? Needless to say, I learned pretty quickly that I wasn't all that important. This is me and this pretty. See the resemblance? But here we've got pretty stars playing on the pen. <laughs> okay, so back to the jar. We've got this jar and we need to fill it, right? So we're going to put these rocks in the jar. Pull out. Basically full? Pretty full? Okay. So that's pretty cool to me. These rocks signify God and the people he has placed in your life. They fill the jar. The rocks are your family. As my mom always used to tell me, your brother, my brother and my sister would one day be my best friends. She was and pretty much always is absolutely right. The rocks are your friends who get you through each day. They're the people you encounter. They're the most important things. Each morning, my, when I was in high school, my dad used to drive me to school. We had to be here at 728. Is that when you have to be here now? Well, we had to be here at 7.20. Anyway, the fours have not been blessed with a sense of urgency about being on time. I used to wake up at 7.05 each morning, go to the kitchen, eat breakfast, get dressed, and then at 7.18 I would start to tell my dad, hey, it's time, we gotta, we gotta go. From this point, it would take anywhere from one to three minutes for us to get out of the room. Now, with the average of red lights and green, green lights, it would take us approximately seven minutes to get to school. One morning we were running pretty late. We got into the car at 7.22, started cruising down the street, and we were passing my little neighbor, Jackie. My dad stopped the car. Rolled down the window and he said, good morning, Jackie. I hope you have a wonderful day. I was fuming. I'm gonna be late, I roared. My dad looked at me and he said, Mary, people are the most important thing in your life. You should never be in such a rush that you don't have time to stop and talk to a human being. All right, I have the car. So now we're going to pour in some bubbles. Everyone. 
mom was blind. She said, my Kayla, why do you wish that? She said, because if everyone were blind, people would like you for who you are, not for what you look like, or what you wear, or what sports you play, or how good you are at things. They just like you. Woo! Because today could be your best day yet. 